Hey, uh, just so you know, we are starting off live. I've got to update the stream information, but hey, uh, just so you know, we are Yay. starting off live. Woo. I've got to update the stream information, but hey, uh, just so you know, we are Yay. starting off Hot off the presses. Uh, there's a newsy song that's like that. Um, that is what is playing in the background now. <laughs> yep. Um, sorry if anyone's checking in real quick, but uh, I just got to update one thing and we'll get started. <laughs> Aggressive dead air. Well, if anyone's here, welcome. Good to meet you. Okay, we are all up to date on that. Yay! And okay. we are all up. Okay, great, cool. So, uh, welcome. This is our first official shop class um, episode. Uh, I'm not sure the format, but uh, I'm Dakota. I'm a member of Shadow of the Cabal, part of the RPG Academy. I'm joined with a special guest and friend, Devin. Hi, my name is Devin. I'm a I'm an artist, and uh, I will possibly be featured on another uh, podcast, which is Shot of the Iron Dragon. Awesome, uh, both L five R podcasts. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we know what we're about. So, uh, <laughs> it's good, good samurai. Yep. So I am um, not classically trained, as Devin might put it. Uh, I'm self-taught. I've uh, I've never had a class teach me how how to paint or anything like that. And to make matters worse, I am colorblind, which means that I have trouble seeing red and green and purple. I am the rods in my eyes don't work, uh, or they don't work well, and that that leads to issues with my vision and when I see certain colors like red. Um, but I like painting. Painting is a really fun thing that I enjoy doing. I like making things, and that's sort of what this this show is going to be about. Um, having fun, painting, working on projects, and, you know, having a good time. Painting is fun. Yes. Painting is. is a good time. Having a ball. So, uh, since this is the first episode, you might be wondering, like, okay, Dakota... I have a miniature, but how do I paint it, or what, what do I need to do? So, um, what, what we have here in this very terrible uh, white balance is a, a Reaper Bones Mini. It is a miniature that you go into a comic book shop and pick up for $2, probably 2 to $4 is about the average price for one of these. This is a, a Monk right here. It's a little hard. Uh, because the, these models come in a, a white plastic, you, um, which has issues with my camera. But uh, what this is, is um, Reaper puts out a miniature that you could theoretically just put paint onto. Now, while you could get started into painting this, we're going to just talk about some, some things real quick before we jump into... Uh, working on what we started in our test stream last week. So on a miniature, because of the casting process, you might be able to see that there is this line of what's called flash running down the side of this, this monk's head. Um, now, this isn't the, the prettiest thing. This isn't something that you want on your final product. So what, what you do is kind of like a... Um, streamline process you get your miniature you, you clean it with some soap and water and dry it off and then uh, typically what you'll want to do is clean the flash off and what that means is uh, usually taking a hobby knife or an exacto uh, whatever type of serrated blade uh, that you have or can purchase and with the blade pointing away from you clean the mold lines off Typically, that will just mean like dragging it off and um, cleaning up the, the mold line here. This 
the, the, I have a question from an amateur. Yes. Would sandpaper work? Yes. Or sandpaper have other issues? No, no. Actually, sandpaper is on my actual list of miscellaneous things you might need. Uh, so typically what I do is I will clean the flash, like the majority of the flash off with a hobby knife. And then when I'm close down to the base of this, like the, the model, I will come in. Uh, do I have any... Uh, come in with some sandpaper. Um, I think this is like 200 or... Uh, I don't know what grit this is. This, is, this isn't this is a very coarse, fine, um, coarse sandpaper. It's fairly fine. And you can just sand away the, the mold lines. So... Do you have issues with losing detail at all when you do that? Um... You can, if you're too vigorous with sanding or the flash, you can uh, score into it with the knife or you could damage the miniature. But um, trust me, when you go to prime uh, the miniature that you're painting, it, it's better that the mold line isn't there. Um, and if you do have some damage of detail, uh, there is uh, ways to fix that. So typically, you'll remove the flash uh, if you do have the damage, like Devin inquired, what you can do is you can take a two-part epoxy. Uh, typically, it's called milliput or uh, green stuff. And what it is is it's a two-part compound that you press together and you form into one solid color. And it works like a clay or an epoxy where you can uh, work it and it'll dry hard. And from there, you can sand and carve in details and uh, actually sculpt. Uh, if, if you're so inclined, you can add detail to a miniature that way. So once you clean that up and do everything, uh, typically what I will do is I will go ahead and prime a miniature in a color. Um, typically I work with either black um, with just like a solid black or I will work with uh, black and white to create uh, some natural light and shadows on a miniature. Uh, in this case, you can see where the highest points are and the lowest points uh, as far as like where light would be falling on the miniature. Why Why do you prime yours? Is there a reason you don't work with like a, a blank white mini? Um, typically, it's because of primer helps paint adhere to the miniature. Um, Kind of like a canvas, some, um, some like paint. gesso, well, like I, gesso. Yeah. I, I can't speak to that, but, uh, oh. it, it helps, Oops. it helps the, uh, the paint adhere to the surface better. So you might ask like, all right, Dakota, this is already seeming to be a lot of things that I mean, I need, uh, I need a miniature, I need a knife, I need sandpaper, maybe like files or whatnot. Uh, I think like, the more majority of what you need is you need a model, you need probably a brush or two. Uh, I tend to work with um, a size one or a size zero round. Um, and then primer, like what primer can you use? Um, Typically, I would say that you could use any sort of primer that adheres to plastic. Uh, I typically work with primer that I can airbrush. There are some that you can also paint on. Uh, you can more than likely find the spray primer at your local automotive store or hobby st or craft store or even like Walmart or things like that. Then, of course, paints. Paints, uh, you're going to want to work with acrylics. Generally, there are some uh, different like styles of paint. Uh, obviously, um, Devin mentioned one, uh, Gesso. Oh, no, Gesso. Gesso is a canvas primer. Oh, I see. Uh, but there's acrylic, there's oil, there's enamel. Uh, there's, you know, so many other different types of paints. But for miniatures, we mostly focus on acrylic. Uh, that, that is because of the natural properties of acrylic paint. It is naturally kind of translucent, and 
when there's enough, it becomes opaque. It's You have to work in layers. Like an onion. <laughs> exactly. Well, like an onion. Um, yeah, and if we're talking about... <laughs> ah, paints. My favorite subject. Um, there's a difference between uh, paint used for uh, models and, or miniatures and between ones used for painting because... I, as a painter, use paint that is comes out of like a tube that's really thick, and I believe you use something different. Um, it depends on the paint that you use uh, in miniature. There's a few lines of paint that are available to people. Uh, there's Games Workshop, uh, P3, which is the Privateer Press, Vallejo, Scale. There's just so many different colors. Ultimately... As long as it's acrylic, you can work with it. Uh, you could take Devin's paint and you could apply it to a miniature. You just want to be careful about how you apply it. Yeah, I, I have done this before and it is hard. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that you want to... I'm going to take my palette lid off here. And we'll get started on doing a little bit of painting. Is that... Where was I going with this? Uh, you're going to want to control the consistency of your paint. And what that means is it might come out thick, but typically you'll want to work with very thin layers of paint. Um, this serves two purposes. One, it allows you to build up to a certain like vibrancy or uh, depth of color. And the other allows you more control over your, uh, your paint and, a lot, and tertiary. Uh, you don't get brush strokes in, in a miniature, which is kind of one of the big like stop gaps to people that are just sitting down and uh, they break out the paint and they start applying it to the miniature. Uh, they put it on very thick and that can obscure detail and can look kind of bad. Um, not to say that it is bad. Um, as long as you are happy with how it turned out, great. Um, but if, if you're having fun, you're doing it right. Exactly. So I have what's called a, a wet palette right here. Uh, what this is is a sponge um, with water that keeps it hydrated. And then uh, I have a sheet of parchment paper and various paints on my palette. What this does is it allows it to keep it um, my paint wet longer. And, and this is because acrylic is plastic and it dries out super fast. Exactly. Um, and the thing that you don't have to go out and spend $10 for this, um, I think it's called a Matterson Stay Wet Palette. You can do this at home with some paper towels, a Tupperware container, and uh, parchment paper. It's the same thing, you just you wet the, the paper towels, you put a parchment on top of the, the wet paper towels, and it'll keep your paint uh, wet, and you just put the lid over it, and it'll hopefully stay wet long uh, for a very good time. So that's, that's sort of the basics, I feel, as far as, like, um, some necessary equipment. Uh, things to consider. You, you definitely don't need the uh, the palette or the sponge or the, any of that. So last week, we, we started on a dwarf as part of a small adventuring party for D&D. &D. So if you were to, like, go out and say you wanted to paint up a bunch of your, your models for your players, like, somebody picks a cleric or a ranger or a, a paladin or um i don't know what did we decide he was a cleric yeah i think we were going with cleric so alchemist paladin ranger cleric yeah. um this is up on twitch and i believe the rpg academy as well uh so if you're kind of curious about us painting it just go ahead and go back and check that out Yeah, I know it's on, on YouTube, at least. Yep. Uh, Devin suggested I show some of the paints, so I will do that. I, I have a few here with me. This is from the, the scale, scale Let line. Let us know your brands. Yes. I, I don't recommend necessarily going out and buying uh, this, this sort of brand. You can do any brand if, if, if you feel necessary. Um, this, this paint is very, it dries very matte, which means that it is very flat looking. Uh, you can kind of see that here in like 
uh, this miniature that I, I worked on, I haven't completely finished, but this was, you can see how it's dried very matte in certain locations, and if I apply more layers, it'll become even more so. Um, can I jump in with like matte versus gloss real quick? Yeah, great. Go for it. Um, so when it comes to painting, uh, it's very easy to get gloss because you can use, uh, which is the shiny surface. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's because you can like add a gloss at the end, but it's hard. You can't go from, it's really hard to go from gloss to matte. Um, because that's scattering light as, or it's absorbing light as opposed to scattering it, which is gloss. Um, so matte first gloss second, I guess. Yes. Uh, just, if you want to be safe and, um, one of the final steps to painting, uh, that I, I haven't spoken to is typically to seal your miniature, uh, and that's using a like spray varnish and you can find that in like three versions gloss matte and satin gloss being very glossy uh, matte being very flat and satin being kind of in the middle excuse me um but if you want a gloss finish typically you you really don't want i find a gloss finish in miniature painting it looks very um I don't have any good examples, but it looks very shiny, very unrealistic, and very uh, not ideal. Typically, you want to emulate uh, either a certain style or a um, or a very realistic appearance. And this and is... you can make things look shiny by painting them to look shiny. Yes. Uh... Pardon me as I focus this up a little bit better. Although, for example, I want to talk about the one thing I painted. Uh, uh, <laughs> the one, one thing I painted. Um, it was kind of like a slimy frog creature. So I, I personally think the gloss was okay in areas for that one. But I'm sure that a th person who is better at making, uh, making minis would have found a way to make it painted in with matte. I, there's no wrong way to paint it, really. I, that, that's all optional. It's all fundamental. Uh, it's how you want it to come across. And if you like how it looks in the end, um, that's great. So let's see here. Let me look at some of these details, see what I have to work with. Um, so it looks like he's got some male gauntlets it doesn't quite look like his flesh is exposed so mostly i will start on the flesh tonight i think with the head and see where we get with that um sorry we didn't get to it earlier but uh hello tater it's good to see you again uh, i'm gonna we talked about this last week and we said we might do like a blue dwarf kind of like counter frost the... dwarf frost dwarf um yeah which totally should be a D, &D race it isn't. i mean no one's stopping no one's stopping you make it yourself exactly uh, yeah devin is a notorious world builder and home brewer yes <laughs> so i'm just putting a very kind of like light blue and a very dark blue on my my palette here uh, and I'm going to use these as my my skin tones, I think. Uh, I haven't tested this. I don't know how this is going to turn out. So we're going to give this a shot and see how it goes. Uh, we're so learning you can, with you. Yeah, just so you can see I have this, this blue and this, this dark blue here. And we'll I'll mix what's called a mid-tone by going from this... Um, this lighter blue, mixing in some of this darker blue until I get something kind of in the middle, like this right here. And I will add a little bit of water. I have some off screen here to kind of get the flow a little bit better. So the way that I've been, I personally was told with consistency, uh, is that if you mix it the correct way, you can put it on a, uh, on like a slippery plastic surface and it won't like uh, turn into like little dots because that's what you do a lot of the time when you when you put down something that's too watery it like condenses into the the dots yeah i have that problem actually um so how do you fix it 
Uh, it's just a way to test if your paint is mixed well. Like if it has the right water to pigment uh, ratio is if you put it down on a plastic surface and it doesn't bead up like that, uh, then it's the right one. And I, oh boy, what is, if it's too thick, you can like see and you can see the buildup on it. Um, but if it's too thin, it, be it beads up and doesn't stay smooth. It's just a way to, to tell whether it's a, the right consistency. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, I, I, I tend to over um, probably uh, not overdo it, but over hydrate. I'm not quite sure the, the word for it, but I typically go very thin. Um, so right now I'm just applying this mid-tone to basically all over the flesh. I'm just going to try and be as neat as I can and not hit any of the eyebrow details but we can always go back later with um, some of the the red and the orange and clean that up if we need to uh, do you want to talk about the reason why we thought it would be cool to make his uh his flesh blue. Sure, we can definitely do that. Uh, so, since the beard is very red, very orange, um, it's not super saturated, which we'll talk about. Uh, it is, there, there is, I guess you could call it theory. Um, it is kind of this idea that uh, colors play off one another in, in certain ways. Um, warm excuse me, warm and cool is one of those. Uh, it is, you can have, I would say two different types of colors. You can have a warm color or a cool color. And uh, technically there's neutrals, but that's, yeah. Even neutrals are have uh, leanings towards warm and cool. Um, but uh, what, what this is about is called contrast. Contrast is a uh, very important thing in art in general, I would say. Um, it's all it's about- very important. Yeah, it's kind of how you kind of pick out details from an, a piece of work, a piece of art or like scenery of like a mountain. Like if you were to go out and uh, go for a hike and look at a hill, on that hill you would see trees, a forest maybe, uh, mountains. How do you tell the difference between the mountain and the trees? Well, typically it would be a different color. So the trees are brown, the mountain is gray. Uh, ergo, there's contrast. If they are both gray, it's kind of hard to tell the trees from the mountain. Which is where value comes in, which is uh, how light or how dar dark is something. So uh, maybe the ground is lighter and the trees are darker, et cetera, et cetera. And that's another place of, val of, of contrast. Yes, that was actually my next point. Oh. No, it's great. You led into that. Well, so value. Set it up. Yeah. Spiked it. So value is pretty key as well into painting. So uh, we're throwing a lot of terms out there. It, it's mostly um, good in composition, I would say. Um, kind of figuring out how these colors work together and how it plays off of art or a miniature or any anything that you're kind of doing there's sort of a balance i feel mm -hmm. it would be safe to say that you need to accomplish and a, a flow and a balance um i think one of the coolest exercises because uh, painting miniatures is really similar to uh, character design. Mm -hmm. um, one of the more interesting things to do is like uh, seeing characters colored with very wrong um, kind of color and value combinations. So, for example, if you take Winnie the Pooh and you take the color of his sweat of his like shirt and color like the rest of him that color, and then colors his shirt like yellow. Uh, that character design falls apart very quickly. And I think a similar, a similar uh, 
that that's an example of balance within a, a character. Yeah, uh, so one of the things that I tend to do with painting, especially because I am I'm very colorblind, I like to pre-plan out based on what I sort of want it to be, and then I'll pick colors and plan accordingly. So I I feel like I do a lot of the elements of character design. I, I keep in mind various uh, contrasts as best as I can, like what would look well against other things. Uh, and it's definitely something you kind of have to keep in mind and think about when you either paint or do character design or any sort of art, I feel. Keeping these sort of basic rules in mind. Uh, I'm obviously no expert. Yeah. Devin is. So if you have any art questions, Hi. <laughs> field it to her. Uh, I'm not painting on Yes, that is my speciality. Uh, yeah, and I think where it comes to color, the, the it's the most simple, but it's kind of like the the biggest rule is is just complementary colors, uh, which is yellow, purple, green, red, uh, orange, blue, all the ones that are opposite each other on the color wheel, um, because those are going to play off each other the best. Um, and if you're worried about a bunch of colors combining if you only use those colors or no here's an example so this is an exercise we did is you had black white and then a pair of complementary colors so i picked red and green and i painted a chicken um <laughs> but i but the color palette looked really good because i was only using those two colors and i could get kind of browns and gray and like warm grays and cool grays uh, because I had a warm and a cool color to play with and um, kind of make uh, this sort of really nice uh, uh, palette. And uh, as long as you kind of like stick to that, uh, as long as you stick to complementary colors, it's really hard to go wrong. So what I'm doing here uh, real quick is I'm what's called black lining. I'm putting a little bit of black in the uh, the eye, and this can help when we come back later and I attempt to uh, do eyes. Eyes are very hard, uh, so it's typically um, it's easier to kind of do this and then layer colors over it so that uh, the eyes don't look so weird. Uh, typically, most people will come in with like a well, they'll paint the eye white and then they'll do the the big dot of black and it tends to give you a more of a um i don't want to say cross-eyed look but it, it can be very hard to paint eyes correctly um and at, at this scale at this size you don't really have to do too much uh you just have to kind of get as best as you can in my opinion you can, there are some people that do really well but um, it's not something the I've of, done too much of myself. The white of your eyes when painting are, it's usually best just not to make them pure white yes. too. Um, technically, most things that you think of as being pure white or pure black are not actually uh, such. Um, most blacks that you will see, for example, are like brown or they can be towards gray or uh, there's different levels of value that go into certain colors and what i'm trying to say is that uh something you might think is white might not necessarily be white it might be a khaki or um a very cream color and especially when it's uh contrasted against dark things things can look like a different absolute value so for example a light gray set against like a black background is going to look white where in reality it's kind of like a gray and I, that's kind of what happens with eyes is since if we have like darker lashes uh you think that like someone's eye is pure white um yeah uh absolute absolute the absolute color like like well fffff i think is what what's for white and like uh, whatever is completely human constructed yeah very passionate about this 
So how we do this is um, typically you'll, I know for working in monochrome now, or in grayscale rather, um, you might not want to do um, white to black. You might do tan with black to build up your grays. Um, and that leaves your white to be the highest uh, value on a miniature. It's actually something I want to try at one point for this class is to do something completely in monochrome uh, using black, khaki, and white in just those three colors and see how that turns out. I think it would be uh, interesting. I think that sounds really cool. Yeah, but you're also a huge color That's nerd. That's like a... I am a huge color nerd. I also value nerd because that's kind of like doing a value study, which you do a lot in, uh, yeah, you do a lot in illustration. You do um, thumbnails and value studies and color studies. Um, so I am touching up the eyebrows real quick because um, I had some spots where paint wasn't fully covering. So I'm just... Make can... them like caterpillars. He has very, very thick eyebrows. Um, and the, the nice thing He's about the nice thing about uh, acrylic paints is that it's it can be very forgiving if you put it on thin. If you uh, it allows you to come back with other colors and layer over and build up to other colors. It's also very good to uh, if you paint very thin to. Um, fix mistakes. So if I mis make a mistake, like I get the blue on the the red, I can come over with a few thin layers of the red and clean up that mistake. So, uh, which is sort of what I'm doing right now. I'm I'm just tidying up a, a few spots before I start to uh, come in with some other colors and start highlighting. It's additive, and you can you can add basically as many layers as you want, which is not entirely true for every other paint, but um, the uh, the advantage of it is that you can go over and cover up edges and change, change things, which like other paints can't always do. Yeah, and I think that looks fine. I'm gonna actually probably just pick out a little bit of this beard and give it a little bit more color as we applied a little bit of a what's called a wash to it earlier and we lost some of the the vibrancy from what would be some of the brighter portions of the beard um, so I'm just giving it a little bit more color from the original color that applied to it um, so I'm gonna start doing a little bit of the flesh I'm gonna pick out the details that would be very high on value on the face. Uh, typically this will be uh, the cheeks, the nose, and top of the forehead, I, I believe. Devin hasn't jumped in to correct me yet, so I assume that is correct. It depends on the source of light. Uh, that's true. Uh, light is very important in a miniature. Um, so I'm just going to Lightly. If it's a light from the top, then yeah, it's cheeks and nose and... Which I'm kind of doing. I'm not doing any sort of major, like, light coming in off the miniature. So I'm just going to assume that the light is above and pick out those details that would be um, coming from above. If we have time before tonight wraps up, I will go grab something where I tried to do an underlighting, which means that the light source is coming from below and up. Um, I was really happy with how that- Is that worked. the one you did at the con? Yes, uh, which I, nice. I enjoyed. I need to find time to work on that and improve upon it and finish it. Uh, I think it'll look pretty awesome when I have a chance. It does, it does look really good. It looks spooky. So I might actually get some white and mix it with my my light blue, and we might go up another layer or two um, in vibrancy. Right now, I've just put on a little bit of a very light blue, 
You get this great sound of me shaking paint. Um, and the this, sound of paint. Yes. Uh, so this white will allow me to get a much brighter color, uh, much more, vi uh, not vibrant, I, I overuse that word, I feel, uh, but it will grab, give me more value. Would that be a better way of putting it? Uh, light? You're putting light on? Yeah, light. it would be value. Yeah, because value is, uh, think about it in three sliders, because that's how I think about it in Photoshop. You have uh, one of the sliders are like the actual color. So like uh, green, blue, yellow, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the next slider is saturation. So that's either how like gray something is or how aggressively pigment pigmented is. So like bright, bright green, like neon green is of course hyper saturated, super saturated. And then like a dull kind of, uh, you know, like, like, I don't know. Like a dull olive green is like a less saturated one. And then the last one is value. And that is how light or how dark something is. I feel like that explanation definitely says how much I use Photoshop, though. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, for the people that don't have uh, either a college address or a lot of money, um, we don't necessarily have access to Photoshop, so... Yeah, but the, it's it's. I think it's still applicable to think about it in three different sliders because those are the three things that kind of like control uh, what what your like your paint color. Mm -hmm. So I'm applying um, I'm applying uh, this very bright mixture to kind of the very top of the head here, and what I'll do is I'll try and even it out because not the whole head wouldn't realistically be this this bright and if you look at someone that doesn't have hair you'll see where the light hits them it's the brightest and then it slowly becomes more of a um a, a darker color uh typically in like a caucasian it's more towards tan uh or like a light um i don't know what color would you consider flesh it, it's it's mostly made of red and greens but flesh it is depends very... on it depends on the flesh. Mm -hmm. um, different people have different undertones, and like it depends on, like where you're from and yeah, exactly. what your background is. Um, so in this case, I'm just putting a little flesh like, is hard sphere, uh, like a round circle. It's how light hits an object that is round is that it has a very bright spot. Um, mm -hmm. So if we think of it like here. Uh, Right, like this, as I try and draw on camera, um, this very center portion would be the brightest spot, and there would be a smaller circle inside this box. Then, as we went out, the color becomes less of a vibrant color and becomes darker. So, as it goes out, the, the gradient decreases. Yeah, it's a gradient. Yes. Uh gradual transition from one one color to another so i am just making sure my my cheekbones are very established here uh the nose and then the forehead it's got a very structured face the dwarf after bird after all um that's true he's built of squares You can already start to see it a little bit. Um, the the blues against the orange, it's very contrasting. I'm gonna darken it down with a with a darker blue here. I'll come in and I'll apply what's called either a glaze or a wash. Welcome back, Tater. And what that'll do is it'll it'll tie Welcome the color, back. it'll tie the colors together and uh, kind of do what we were talking about with the gradient and uh, make it a, a blend, uh, a gradient. So I'm just, uh, I'm applying a lot of water to my paints. Um, I'll just show you here. Um, this right here, I'm just, there's a lot of water on this. You can see how it, it flows differently than um, this, this paint right here, which seems very thick. You know, there isn't as much movement. So what I do is I'll get some of it on my brush, not too much. Um, if this, since this is what's called uh, like a wash or a glaze, 
the difference is how you apply it. If I was to apply it like this as it is, it'll pool in all the recess detail, uh, which is can be a time-saving tool, uh, this sort of like all over application. Um, or you could you can remove most of this, this liquid onto like a paper towel and you can have what's called a glaze, which is sort of the same process, but it allows us to kind of tint um, the colors and do more gradual blending over multiple coats. So I'm just applying this here in like the, the darkest parts of the nose. Um, I'm applying it like this, the brightest edge of the cheek, the section above it would, well, technically the section below it would be the darkest and the section above it would be the darkest. Well, towards the darkest portion. So I am just applying that so that there are some contrasts. Contrast, my favorite word. Yes, that's the word of the day. Word of the day? The number of the day is four, and contrast is the word of the day. Uh, so, faces are hard. Yes, faces are very hard. It's not something I would completely recommend you start with. Um, I would... I got started painting Warhammer 40,000, 40, um, which are typically um, kind of round spheres and armor, so there's not a lot of flesh. So a little bit more forgiving in that regard, but um, it's definitely something you, ha you have to come around to at some point and give it a shot. So what I'm going to try and Lots do... Lots of shiny... So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and start about not all the way at the top and pull down into my shadow. What this allows me to do is it starts to give me a, um, a gradient because there's a transition between the two colors. Uh, there's the, the mid-tone, which we applied initially, um, the, the highest color. And then since I applied this dark color in between and towards the darkest portions, it starts to kind of tie it all together into a gradient. And there are much better people out there at explaining these concepts that I implore you to go kind of check out and understand and um, learn from. Um, I think it's a subject for maybe later, but uh, parent artists, I'm not I think there's a discussion that might be. Oh, uh, so it's the idea of an artist who is uh, very, very good at something you want to be want to look want to be good at, and uh, kind of looking at them to understand how they go about it. Mm -hmm. I understand. Uh, uh, yeah, one of the the best things I I can suggest that you do is uh, if you're interested. There are tons of people on YouTube and Instagram and Reddit and all the major like social media platforms out there that are into this. You just have to find the, the communities and just go and like look at the, the most popular, the, the best art. Find someone's style that you really, um, that just really resonates with you. And just kind of, Devin calls it uh, a master study, I believe. A uh, master copy. Master copy. That's where you me. you tap, do you tap to replicate uh, their style and through the process understand how they did it. Is that a good way to put that? Yeah. Yeah. Traditionally in two um, D, the idea is uh, to like take an illustration that they did and uh, copy it. Uh, exactly to understand what they did with value and color. Um, it's a it's a technique for uh, improving and kind of understanding uh, what the masters do uh, before you go on to create your own your own thing. Yeah, I've I've never done one with painting. I think it's a great idea. Um, there are a lot of people out there that have some very interesting techniques that I would love to like 
learn, but they're very difficult. Uh, chief among them is a style called Loaded Brush. What that is, is um, to give you a quick little example, um, the, the painter Ben Comets, uh, a German painter, he will take uh, a color, so like this blue right here, and he'll he'll put it in the, the bristles of the brush. Um, let's see here. Uh, it's not the best, but you can see that the, the paint's in the brush. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll take a little bit of white just on the tip, not a lot. And uh, you can see a little bit of paint there just on the tip. And as they apply the paints, as they draw it down into surfaces, um, they, they get the lightest point at a section. And as they draw it down, it, it creates this very natural uh, transition, which uh, if done right, looks like black magic. So they're able to make these very intricate, very detailed blends in a, basically a single stroke of the brush. They've sold their soul to the devil. If you've seen their art, yes, they have. Uh, it's a very good, very good <laughs> painter. There are a lot of talented people out there that are all amazing at, at, at this. Um, and it's definitely nice to have some people that you like. But it's also good to kind of look at a lot of different people in that regard. Um, to vary your... Uh, diversify your tastes i would say uh, yeah and uh that's kind of where creativity comes from is having sort of very diverse interests and tastes because then you have uh multiple contexts to draw from that's just good in general i don't know if that's too yeah um i'd also say this is a big a big thing when is is if you're if you're painting metal like look at metal because yes. there's going to be information to pull from from other artists, but the best information you can get is from looking, is from looking at what you're painting, like uh, really yes. looking at uh, reference. So, for example, uh, I'm gonna probably make some people sick as I unscrew my my thing here, but I have these very metal lamps, um, as you can see here, and this is sort of kind of like a brushed, uh, very dusty lamp, uh, but it's not flat. There are little grooves. I'm not completely focused up on it because that's not where I structured it for. But uh, it's very worked. You can kind of see it in the brushed, center. Brushed, brushed metal, brushed metal. is the term. Um, because if you take a metallic paint, like uh, I have this very silver color right here, and you just apply it to a flat surface, it's just going to be one uniform silver color. It's not going to have... Uh, what looks to be a metallic surface and what for example I, I didn't really do much here with it but um, let me try and get back into where I was at um, oops. Uh, focus I kind of went in with uh, some brush strokes. So I have a darker silver uh, as a base color, and then I went in at an angle, and I tried to do kind of a brushed metal look, uh, which might not necessarily be accurate for a sword like this, but um, you have to try these things out. You have to you have to experiment. You have to take risks, which I'm bad at usually, but uh, it's good to kind of push yourself that's what i'm here for i've gone offline three times not sure if it's you or me um it's likely you tater i i've kept an eye on both uh twitch and youtube and i haven't seen it gone down yet but if that is the case i appreciate you letting us know i've been keeping an eye on things haven't seen anything but i can i can keep an eye on other things as well so, um, one of the things that I'm doing here is I'm applying a little bit of white at the brightest section of the face here. And it's trying to keep it just a little bit, just not too much. So, uh, let's see here if that'll focus any better. 
You can, you can see it's picking up on the cheeks. Just great. Yeah. Um, and then I'll do that as well here on the, the top of the head. Just apply a little bit and try and get that highest point. Because this, this would be where the light is hitting the most. Um, it's not necessarily going to be a lot of light. Um, typically what we're wanting to do with miniature painting is we're trying to impart light value color onto a miniature as if it was an object that existed in reality. Um, typically we it's trying to recreate a sense of uh, reality in, in an art piece as like you would in a painting. Um, you know people that do uh, portraits of fruit and um, like watering cans and things like that. They attempt to d impart reality onto a two-dimensional surface. We're kind of doing the opposite, where we're taking a three-dimensional object and we're trying to impart um, two-dimensional values, I feel. Yeah, it's a, yeah, make it look, um... Yeah, I guess you're using two-dimensional techniques to make a three-dimensional thing look even more three-dimensional. Which yeah. I feel like is kind of a complicated curve of thought. Also, you know, I'm just, thank you for joining us even though you keep dropping. It's real cool. Yeah, no, thanks for Thumbs hanging up. out with us. Um, I probably should have reminded people about uh, this, but I did let people know. So I appreciate you for showing I dropped showing it in up. a couple places. Sorry. I'm just getting some uh, water because it is getting very hot in here. It is very cold here. So I'm going to uh, just probably come in with a little bit of this lighter color here and take out a little bit more of the details that might have been toned down. Um, yep, these are more highlights. Yes. And this just kind of reinforces the blend from the light to the dark. Um, How do you feel about uh, shading with absolute white and absolute dark? Uh, typically, that's not something I think you necessarily absolute want black. to do. You are painting these to be no, static displays. Oh, sorry. Uh, you are painting these to be static displays and not part of a diorama or a game. Um, in me, in the case of this, this model, um, this is just a static display. Um, we might do like a little bit of, um, like a diorama or a display base for it at some point. Uh, it's definitely something I want to, want to try. Um, but no, this isn't for a game. This is, but all these techniques can be applied to games. Uh, this is for a game called Guild Ball. Uh, I would use the same techniques that I've been using for, oh, yep, I, I forgot to do that. I appreciate that, Shadzar. Uh, I typically put on creative. I forgot to do it this week, but I'll make sure I do that next week. Um, yeah, uh, but to continue, uh, these techniques you can apply to a lot of different things. You can apply it to... Uh, miniature games like Guild Ball, which is like a, a fantasy soccer kind of rugby game. It's, I find it, it's pretty fun. Uh, you can apply it for your D&D &D party. Um, if, if you use miniatures or um, a grid or things like that, uh, you're typically going to have a miniature or you're just going to use dice to kind of stand in for it. But um, if you want to, like, if you want to make it like the... Um, the Penny Arcade Acquisitions Incorporated games, you, you kind of have to uh, roll up your sleeves and get creative and make that giant airship or uh, uh, that terrain, which is something I, I hope to one day be able to do on this. Yes, we should paint terrain. That sounds really fun. Uh, hopefully you will be able to uh, make terrain and then paint it. 
Uh, <gasps> Even better. Yeah. Um, so, let's see here. I've always wanted to make uh, a set for my game at some point, which I might do for, like, the finale oh. of a game I'm running. Well, um, th there are a bunch of ways that I kind of want to... Oh, well, we're actually only streaming for an hour. Uh, this is part of a uh, RPG uh, network. Uh, so my slot is only for an hour, typically. We might go for more in the future, but for now, we're just painting for about an hour, hanging out and talking. Um, yeah, I'll probably change it after. Uh, but um, typically... Um, we're just going to work for about 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm West Coast, so this is 6 to 7, which is sort of in my wheelhouse and not necessarily uh, too late or too early, I feel. Um, it's kind of the, the best possible time for this as far as I can. I don't know. 9 to 10 is pretty, pretty early. Well, you're also a college student, Devin, and you don't work in very early hours of the day. You don't know me. Um, yeah, it's a different situation. Yeah. Not for long, though. Soon you'll have to join us in the, the wage slaves. Finally. Free me. So I'm just coming in with a little bit of the, the darker color plus a little bit of black. And I'm applying this at the, the kind of the edges. And this will be like a shade or a shadow. See, I typically, when I paint, I paint a little closer to to my body, where I can have both my elbows braced on a surface so my hands don't shake. Uh, but for camera, I, I'm trying my best to keep it in focus and to be able to paint as best as I can, which might be harder than you think. Um, so I'm just going to apply these last little bits of shade here at the darker portions of the cheek. Just under it. And what, what this does is when we apply light colors next to dark colors, uh, we get some contrast. Yeah! Contrast! Woo! -hoo. Contrast, my favorite thing. Yeah. So I think this is starting to turn out pretty nice for uh, the face. Uh, we have some nice, um, let's see here if I can get a good zoom in before we stop for the night. Uh, I'll also go grab my, my underlit piece before we stop too, but let's see here if I can get this nice and focused. Um, let's see here. Come on. Uh, Bring oh. the mat closer. Oh, that's a good point. Uh, that way it doesn't have a choice. I don't have much of an autofocus situation going on here yet. There we go. Yeah, we're a little bit outside the light, but... Uh, come on. Hey! Uh, yeah, there you go. You can see yeah, his good. cheeks are kind of light, and then, you know, up here at the top, I probably would do a little bit more um, work towards getting that transition a little bit smoother, but you can kind of see the start of it. I'll try and get some pictures up uh, as kind of as we go along, but that's where we're at for tonight. We have started a little bit of the, the face here. Uh, and if you give me a moment, I will be right back. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's been a blast to be on this channel. <laughs> I think it looks really good. I'm glad we're doing a cleric. I love cleric. I'm going to make him do a pattern around the edge of the cloak because I think patterns are really cool on clothing. Um, and I'm a sucker for textures and patterns. So 
I hope that's going to happen. No, I know that's going to happen. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so what I have here is something, uh, what's called a bust. A bust uh, being not like a full miniature, it's mostly for display or art purposes. Um, this is from, I want to say it's the Nocturnal line uh, by Francisco Fabarelli. I, I, he's an Italian painter uh, and he, he's, he's done this co-partnership uh, with a, a sculptor and this is one of the pieces. Um, this is like a demon general. It's a very nice bust. Um, obviously a work in progress, but I did this at a convention that I went to. And I I wanted to capture um, light from below. Typically, I've mostly painted from above at an angle, kind of like how we've done here. Um, we've made it so that our highlights are from, from an angle coming down. So... Kind of like if I move this light here, um, uh, where the light would hit the most would be how we're painting. So in the case of this one, the light is coming from below and coming up. So um, it's not necessarily amazing, but I, I really liked how it's been coming along. I definitely need to do a little bit more work on it. Uh, I haven't had the time, but there's some really like... I wanted to do like fire, like it was uh, like you standing over like a burning town or something, uh, and you can kind of see how, um, well, he he has the the look of a of a reaver or a rampager or a destroyer, and no 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 it's true. Um, I I wanted to encapsulate that, so I I I went for a very dark blue skin, um, as you can kind of see in here. Um, and then the orange and the reds are kind of the light, of the fire, and uh, I definitely really enjoyed the work on this so far. Um, I'm going to see where I can go with it at some point when I find time, but uh, this is the sort of thing that miniature painting um, can do. I, this is probably one of my more uh, interesting pieces that I've done so far, uh, but I definitely had fun doing it. So if anything like this interests you, it might not necessarily be miniature painting for like D&D &D or for games. Uh, you might have an interest in doing like art pieces. Uh, this is a fairly large scale bust, but this is something that you can apply all the techniques we've done to this. This is all the same sort of thing that I, I've done tonight. I have established colors, I've layered, I've highlighted, uh, I've the eyes in this piece are very simplistic, but I think the black and the white, very, very nice in some regards. Uh, very demonic. Uh, I, I've tried some things. Uh, this is a kind of monochrome to uh, tinted with a green gold color to make it look like gold. Uh, I might redo this because this doesn't look great, but... Uh, We'll talk about that at a later point, because uh, we're over time. But um, yeah, no, I, I wanted to uh, say thank you to everyone that showed up tonight and joined us. Uh, we're going to be hopefully doing this every week, Thursdays, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to 10 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we're part of the RPG. At that 7 to, 7 to 8 for Central. the other side of the coast. Yes. Uh, Central? Oh. Central. So Central is here um one hour behind eastern so it is eight to nine central and then west coast it's three hours behind so uh six to seven p.m uh pacific standard time we're part of the rpg academy which is a podcast and uh we're getting into streaming and all that but uh, we're mostly an RPG podcast with a bunch of different groups. Uh, my name is Dakota. I'm part of Shadow of the Cabal, which is an actual play podcast. Uh, I was joined tonight with Devin. Uh, Devin, would you feel free to plug yourself? 
Yeah. Uh, my name is Devin. Uh, you can find my uh, you can find my Twitter and my Instagram at uh, DGeorge Studios, and my uh, website is DevinGeorgeStudios.com. Uh, go check me out and say hi. Yep. Uh, we are friends. Uh, we hopefully will continue to bring you more painting, more fun, just hanging out, talking about art. Uh, I definitely like it, and I hope that you guys did. I uh, hope you all have fun. Um, you can support the RPG Finger Guns. Yes. Uh, you can support the RPG Sorry. Academy <laughs> at patreon.com slash the RPG Academy. Uh, we might set up a Patreon for this cl- this show, but I'm not completely worried about it. Uh, we'll end out the night with uh, the motto of the, the Academy that uh, if you're having fun, you're doing it right. So thank you guys for joining us and have a nice night. Thank you. <laughs>